Good morning, everybody. I'm still having to adjust uh, to this um, new technology. Today is uh, the day we celebrate the resurrection. And praise God to that. And a lot of you guys look extra nice today. I'm wearing pink. To encourage my wife to wear, she wanted me to wear pink, so amen, I'm wearing pink. And uh, today is my beautiful wife's birthday as well, amen. <laughs> Happy 25th, you know, amen. <laughs> but amen. Um, I'm especially also honored today because uh, my dad is actually visiting from El Salvador, and uh, he's here with us for the weekend, so Amen. So it's been great to connect with him more and more over the past couple of years. I'm sure he's, like, look him up here. That's my son preaching. Amen. But today we celebrate because Jesus has been resurrected. He has risen. And all of us should be grateful and thankful because it's the center of our faith. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned, all fall short. So all of us here are sinners. All of us need a savior. So who of us can boast? What are you going to boast about? I'm less of a sinner than the next person? We all need Jesus. We all need a savior. And when we truly understand the resurrection, it changes us. It transforms us. We don't live for the now, but we live for the eternity. It's the power of the message of resurrection. And it gives us such great hope, doesn't it? The Apostle Paul, who's in chains, would even say, I stand on trial because of the hope or the, of the resurrection of the dead. When he's before King Agrippa in Acts 26 and Governor Felix, he even makes it clear, listen, Jesus came back to rescue his own people and to open the eyes of everyone to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan. And they're like, what's going on? He's, he's there with chains, but he has such confidence, even in chains. And he's told, you're out of your mind, Paul, because he's very educated, very together. But he goes, you're out of your mind, and your great learning has driven you insane. And he goes, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. He has great hope in the resurrection. Our faith is connected to the resurrection. Today we celebrate Easter all because of Jesus. And it's good for us to remember what Jesus has done for us. Please turn with me to Mark 15. Mark 15. We're going to focus this morning on Mark 16, but I'll read before that. You know, all this year, if you've been visiting with us, all this year we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark. And going back to the beginning of our faith to remind ourselves of who we're following and how amazing Jesus is. To remove Jesus, all we're trying to do is be good people. To remove Jesus, all we're trying to do is be a better version of ourselves. But Jesus is everything. So we focus everything on Jesus. We'll pick up in, in chapter 15, verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Elo, Elo, Lima, Sambachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine and vinegar, put on the staff, and offered it Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when a a centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some of the women who were watching from a distance, among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Salomon, Salmoni. And Galilee, these women had followed him to care for his needs, and many other women who had come up with, Jesus, with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day. That's the day before the Sabbath. So the evening approached, 
Joseph of Armorethia, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly, boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate was surprised to hear that he had already, was already dead. Summon, summon, summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought, bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in the tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolls a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And Mary, Magdalene, and Mary, mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid in our text this morning. And when the Sabbath was over, Mary, Magdalene, the mother, Mary, mother of James, and Salomone brought spices there, bought spices so that they might go to the anoint Jesus' body. But very early in the morning, the first day of the week, Jesus, just after the sunrise, they're on their way to the tomb, and they ask each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw the stone that was very large was rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be afraid, he said. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where he, they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he is going to, going to go ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's our text. Interesting, it's interesting that the centurion is there, had not watched Jesus his whole life, hadn't been around him, but it's centurion at the cross. It says, just by seeing how Jesus died. How many deaths had a centurion had seen up to that point? How callous had, had he become? By just by seeing Jesus, your Lord, our Lord, he exclaimed, surely this man was the son of God. And it says that Mary's there, and, they're there, and also Mary, another sister there. They're watching, and they're, and they're watching from a distance where the other disciples at. They had fled. The brothers had fled. And these women are witnessing Jesus die. From a distance, it says. And then we hear about Joseph, who, who is bold enough to come up to Pilate and ask for the body. And, and he's trying to figure out, he's surprised he's already dead. Ask the centurion, is he dead? Here, take the body. And he takes the body. In John's account, the Gospel of John, it says that who's with them is Nicodemus. And that together with 75 pounds of mixture of myrrh and aloes, they prepare the body. This is the same Nicodemus who would come to Jesus at night in the beginning of the Gospel of John. And then it says that they rolled the stone. And you know what's interesting is that Mark's account only tells us about Friday and Sunday. But what happened on Saturday? What happened on Saturday? We cannot begin to imagine the sadness and discouragement that happened that day to the disciples. And I heard a great sermon this past week about how God allows us to go through Saturdays in our lives. And if you're going to follow God, part of that means there'll be days and times of complete discouragement. And that was that Saturday. But Mark's account gives us Friday and Sunday. But I'll read to you what happens on that Saturday. Hear this. Matthew 27 says, The next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to, the, went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, that after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead, and that last deception will be worse than, worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and, put, and made the tomb secure, and also putting a seal on the stone, they posted guard. So on Saturday, while the disciples are discouraged, here you have behind the scene, evil is lurking and working, saying, hey, Jesus said he's going to resurrect or he's going to come out. Let's make sure that he's a deceiver. Let's make sure we secure it. Like, very well. And they put all types of guards. And it's a lot more than one or two because later on in Matthew it says some reported that he had escaped. That aside, 
But it tells you that there's a lot of, hap- lot of things happening on Saturday. Evil is always working. Two points this morning. Point number one for this Easter morning. Put all your hope in Jesus. Put all your hope in Jesus. In our text that we're focused on, it says in Mark 16, verse 1, it says that after the, when the Sabbath was over, the sisters, they had bought spices, but they wanted to bring them to anoint Jesus' body. And it's amazing. These sisters, oh, they're inspiring. Having witnessed the death of Jesus and kept a distance to watch where he's going to be buried. And here they must have been in mourning, but they're bringing spices because they care about Jesus so much they don't want the smell of decay. So they're on their way to get there, and they miss a very important part. And it's, the Bible has everything, by the way. It even has comedy, too. It says, on their way there, they forgot a very important part. And verse 3, who's going to roll away the stone? They thought about everything but that. And how important is that? Very important. But then it says, when they got there in verse 4, it says, they looked up and they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And then they have a divine encounter with an angel. What's amazing is these sisters have no idea what happened behind the scenes. They don't know anything about the guards because the guards have been taken care of. By who? An angel. And when they see the angel, the angel says, hey, don't be alarmed. Like, what's, what's going on? The stone is, they're looking, where's the body? The, the stone's not here. They had no idea. In Matthew's account, it tells us what's, what happens while the sisters are getting themselves ready to come over to the tomb. In Matthew's account, it, it tells us that there was such a violent earthquake that an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. He goes to the tomb, rolls back the stone, and then sits on it. One angel. But I thought they made the tomb secure. And Matthew's account also says that after they report, some of them report what happened. They said some of them, and they referred to soldiers. How many were there? A lot more than two, a lot more than three. Use your imagination. It doesn't matter because an angel shows up. And there's something interesting with that. Oh, by the way, I also love Matthew's account where it says the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And it happens more than once in the Bible. Whenever there's a divine messenger, an angel shows up, mere mortals, we're all terrified. And I don't care how tough you think you are. If an angel showed up, And this angel shook up everybody. We'd be terrified too. I mean, Zechariah is described in Luke chapter 1. It says that when he saw an angel, it said he was startled and he was gripped with fear. I love these parts of the Bible because it almost like peels back to go, there's something deeper going on. And sometimes, by the way, we get too comfortable with Jesus. And we forget how powerful he is. Because didn't Jesus tell Peter not too long ago, Put your sword back, for all who draw the sword would die by the sword. And he goes, do you, it gives him, it reminds him who he is. Do you not think that I can call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? One legion is 6,000 at least. We're talking about over 70,000 angels. By the way, he just says, that's just at my disposal. What else does he have? Put, a, put aside a legion, this is one in Mark's account. And I like what the, the angel says to the women, you know, because uh, they're alarmed. In Matthew's account, this is, what they, this is what the angel says. He's not here. He has risen. And I love these four words. Just as he said. And by the way, the angels, it's not like the guards are fighting him. There's no battle, by the way, it takes place. They just are terrified of him, and they go. You would think there'd be some battle, but there is no battle. And uh, I'm glad they didn't do that, because it probably wouldn't have worked out for them too well. 
But the angel is just so confident, sitting down going, just as he told you. Just as Jesus said, it was fulfilled. And it's good to remember that even in hopeless moments, God has and always will have a plan. Put all your hope in Jesus. So it's good to remind ourselves to fix our eyes on Jesus, isn't it? You know, up to this point, as we're finishing Mark, up to this point, we've looked at so much as what Jesus had done. And think about this. Even without his death, he's worthy to be followed. Even without the resurrection, he is worthy to be followed. In Mark 1, he drives out a spirit. He helps Peter's mother-in-law. He heals a leopard. He also heals a paralytic man. He eats with sinners. He calms storms. He walks on water, feeds 5,000, feeds 4,000. In Mark 5, he drives out 5,000 demons out of a man. He's worthy to be followed. And not just that, just by just watching Jesus and see how he connects with people, he's worthy to be followed. In Mark 5, he raised a little girl from the dead, and it says he takes her by the hand and says, little girl, get up. The intimacy of our Lord. He heals a woman bleeding for 12 years, and he calls her daughter. I, also, I enjoy this in Mark chapter 7, when he heals a deaf man, it says he touches the man's ears, and he touches him, and he says, apatha, which means be open. But it's not just the fact that it was open, but here's a man whose death, but Jesus connects with him because I'm sure we can imagine he could read lips. And you see, I bet that. We have a Lord that connects with us. And on top of all that, he pays our debt of sin. And all of us have sins we're ashamed of. We have sins that we have regrets with. With Jesus, it's paid. I don't know how you would feel if you went home today and someone knocked on your door and said, hey, I'm here to take care of all your financial debt. I'm just saying, how would you feel? I think most of you guys probably have like $100 of debt. Don't look down now. Me too, I'd be like, if that happened, what's the catch? <laughs> to pay our physical debt, but Jesus paid all of our debt. He erases all the shame and the guilt. And on top of that, if that's not enough, he conquers death. We don't have to be afraid of death anymore. And Paul reminds us, as in 1 Corinthians, he's referring to a prophecy from Hosea, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on, he says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. He says, Let nothing move you. Let nothing move you. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Wow. Wow. Even Jesus would tell them earlier, he says, in this world you'll have trouble and suffering, but take courage, I have conquered the world. So we have this great confidence because of resurrection. Paul reminds him in Colossians, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us to the kingdom of his son. We have redemption of the forgiveness of sins. In Ephesians, he reminds them, as for you, you were at one point dead in your transgressions and sins, but because of, because of Christ, you're made alive. He is our hope. As Peter writes in 1 Peter 3.21, he saves you because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Put all your hope in Jesus. But be very careful, because the hope that you have in something is a choice. Where has your hope been so far this year? It is a choice where you put your hope in. Is your hope in Jesus? As married, have you put your hope in Jesus together? As singles, have you put your hope in Jesus? As parents, have we helped our kids put their hope in Jesus? 
Where is your hope at this morning? Is it in people? What happens when you put your hope in people? Peter writes this in 1 Peter 1.21. He's actually quoting Isaiah 40. He goes, all people are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass, the grass withers and falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And Paul, seeing the church in Corinth, he sees some sickness in the church. And he says in 1 Corinthians 1, he goes, some of you say, I follow Paul, I follow Apollo, some, I follow Cephas, another. He goes, what? Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or you baptize the name of Paul, that even as disciples, we can lose sight of Jesus and focus on people. And what happens when you focus on people? You get discouraged. We can put our hope in possessions. In Matthew 6, it says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures for yourselves in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy. And where thieves do not break in and steal. We put ourselves in the, native, the, the, the latest things. If I just have that, I'll be happy, whatever that is. We have old shirts we use as rags in the house. I was talking to my dad. My, my, my son has like the new Nintendo Switch. Remember the old Nintendo? The first one? Remember the robot? Remember Duck Hunt? That was like cutting edge right there, man. You struggle with sin against that, what was that, was that dog that laughed at you or something? We put our hope in all these things and we get, com or we try to get comfort from possessions. And Jesus is there. Or we put our hope in the government. Dramatic pause, dramatic pause. You know, interesting, not too long before this, in Mark 15, it tells us that Pilate had a custom, and at a festival, he would actually release a prisoner. And there's two options they have. One is Jesus, and one is Barabbas. And it says that Barabbas was in prison because, of an, because he had murdered somebody trying to have an insurrection and overthrow, really, Rome. What I love about Matthew's account is it gives us Barabbas' full name. And what's his full name? Jesus Barabbas. So now you have, before Pilate, who do you want? You want Jesus or Jesus Barabbas? Who do they want? Barabbas. Why? Because in their minds, their hope for true happiness is to overthrow Rome. Because the issue is, let's get rid of the government and we'll be all happy skipping together. And a lot of you have, have fallen for that. And we think November 7th, yes, we'll be happy. Hey, man, you live in a country that gives you options. Hey, there you go to vote. You can exercise your... I'm not talking about that. Exercise your... All I'm saying, no matter where you're at, El Salvador, wherever, you know, it doesn't matter. We put our hope, and people will be disappointed. We put our hope in possessions, we'll be disappointed. We put our hope in government, we'll be disappointed. And sometimes we have Jesus in front of us, but we choose Jesus Barabbas. So no wonder we're not happy. When Jesus is right there. Or sadly, we put hope in ourselves. And Peter had just said not too long before this, if everyone, even if I have to die with you, I, I will never disown you. And does he? He does. We put our hope even in ourselves. Possessions, things, our own health. Not really, I think. We get older, it's humbling, but what do we put our hope at? 
I'll be happy if I pursue. Let's put our hope in Jesus. It's a choice. It's a choice. The resurrection gives us that. And you, know, you, can, always, you can always know how, if, if the resurrection actually changes somebody. Titus would write, uh, in Titus, Paul writes, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. It's to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Like, yes. First Peter says he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Why? So we may die to sins and live for righteousness. It's by his wounds you've been healed. So we have that hope in Jesus. We put all of our hope in Jesus. Not in people, not in things, not in government, not in our own health, not in ourselves. But in Jesus, it's a choice. Amen? Second and last point. Take this message home. Take this message home. Going back, you know, here, the, the sisters are terrified for sure. And the angel, having just shook up all these soldiers, is just sitting there and just says, don't be alarmed. It says in verse 6, don't be alarmed, he said, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So it's just amazing. It's like, hey, come on in. Check out the empty tomb. Like, wow. And then they're given an assignment. In verse 7, go tell his disciples and Peter that basically he has risen. In Matthew's account, it says specifically, go quickly, so right away, and go tell the disciples. Where are the disciples at this point? Discouraged. Complete discouragement. I cannot imagine there what I want to feel, and I know I will never will, what they felt in that one room. But the message is, go tell them that he has risen from the dead. And then it says in verse 8 that they were trembling but bewildered, but they went out. In Matthew's account, it says they were afraid but filled with joy, and they ran. Like, wow! They see, I can't imagine. You, you see the empty, empty tomb, go back and tell them. And they're, 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 they're terrified but filled with joy, and they're running. And it's amazing. It's amazing that like they're entrusted with really the most important message of all history. They have been entrusted with this message. And it's not an angel that goes tells the brothers. It's they, these women. You're going to do it. Like, wow. And they go on foot and they're running. We don't know who I run, ran who, but amen. But here is a group that's so discouraged. They need to hear this message of resurrection. Paul would even say, reminds of the Old Testament, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Referring to the gospel. They're discouraged, they're down, but this message will help them get their faith back. But it does give us insight about God's ultimate plan of the resurrection. The ultimate plan will be that this message will go from person to person. And all of us here heard it by word of mouth. All of us. By words. Because it's powerful and it's true that your words have the ability to increase faith. You do. And we also know our words can discourage, can't it? We can crush people with our words. Proverbs 18.21 says the tongue has the power of life and death. And these sisters, they brought life. And no, it's, it's, it's powerful. It's good to think about it. And if they need to hear that message, so do we. We need to be reminded of the resurrection, brothers and sisters. And if they can go from this complete discouragement and start getting their courage back, can't you? 
So I don't know where you've been at in your faith. I don't know where you're at in your walk with God. And perhaps you're walking on water. Amen. I'm like, where have you been at the past couple of years? Huh? Amen. But what we need is to reflect on the resurrection. And sometimes we want more. Because resurrection isn't enough. The real solution is more church programs. The real solution is we need to do this. We need to do that. No, the solution is meditation on the greatest gift. The greatest gift, the salvation of our souls. We need to hear that message. And if this room of, this, of apostles need, needed that message, so do we. And they're discouraged. But man, and what I also love about this is, um, I think I said this before, I, I've been doing my research on my DNA. Any of you guys do that? Yeah. I actually like mine a lot, actually. Pretty cool. Amen. We can try to go back as far as you can and go, oh, put aside the physical, but ancestry. Our spiritual ancestry goes back to these women. And one of the women, it says she was filled with seven demons at one point. And God would restore her, Jesus would restore her, and then use her to bring this message of resurrection. And we can trace back our spiritual lineage back to her. If God can use her, God can use you. We need this message. And from this one room, what happens next? The next book is what? The book of Acts. And there's people waiting over there to hear it. Barnabas needs to hear this message. Apollos needs to hear this message. The Ethiopian needs to hear this message. Cornelius. And what's amazing, even through persecution, this message is going out. Acts 11 says, it says, now those who've been scattered by the persecution that broke out, what do they do? They keep spreading this message. What message is that? About the resurrection. They travel by foot, by boat, by chariot, but they're bringing this message. Lydia in Acts 16 needs to hear this message. And not just her, but her whole household is saved. Because this message transforms lives for eternity. We can, we can lose that. We celebrate this day. And there's something powerful of hearing it from somebody. I like to think of it as, believe it or not, I've said it before a long time ago, all of us are like walking billboards. An advertisement, I don't want to say advertisement, but we're, we're like pointing everyone back, we shouldn't point anyone back to Jesus. Oh, man. You turn the news, you turn the news on and you're like, can I get some encouragement? Is there anything, any happy news anywhere? I guess if it bleeds, it reads, right? A lot of bleeding is sad. I don't care what news you watch. It's like, no matter who you are, you're like, this world's a mess. And the solution is Jesus. And I can sit and get angry and complain, and, but I go, man, I, I need to pray and pray and pray and pray. But what can I do? What can you do? One, you need to first hear that message again but also share that message. I think it's also good for us to reflect and ask ourselves, in the privacy of your home, are you discouraged? Where's the faith bat been at your home? Not here on Sunday morning, and praise God you're here. But when you're by yourself, or if you're married with your spouse, what fills your conversations? Negativity? Discouragement? Lord forbid criticalness, because that's going to build up faith. Does it? It doesn't. Or like honey, or whatever you call each other, or hey, if you're living with singles, or, we've got to think more about Jesus. He's the way out. That message is important. And for us who have kids, what do they hear with us? Discouraging news? Lord forbid that we leave I'm sure this group would never do that. Leave church and go, can you believe church? You guys will never do that. I've been guilty of that too. Right? So. 
It's like, man, I, I got to repent. Like, I, will my conversation be filled with that negativity? I, there's enough negativity. I, I need a, my home. Man, I need how my kids think about God and the hope of Jesus. The apostles go from discouragement to complete hope all because of words. It's the power of your words. We need to hear that. And we need to pass that on, brothers and sisters. We need to hear that. As we finish up here, Paul will say in 1 Corinthians, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not what is, what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is only, it says, temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. We celebrate the resurrection. It's because of Jesus that we stand with joy. Let us put our hope in Jesus. Let us make that choice and decide again to do that. Put all of our confidence in Jesus. And if Jesus was worthy to be followed before the resurrection, all the more, shouldn't we? But let's begin by taking that message in the privacy of our homes. To lift our faith, even in discouraged home, to have joy back on God. Because God wants to use us to make an impact on this lost world. Happy Easter. Thank you for your time.